art forms that are emerging that are new, progressive, um, very notable. And we're going to talk a little bit about uh, John, Jan van Eyck and uh, his realism. And then we have uh, some movements in thought and culture that are worthy of, of discussing. As we approach the Reformation, we're going to look at some pre-Reformation um, movements in thought and devotion to uh, in Christianity in what we call the Devotio Moderna. So this will deal with Renaissance to Reformation in the north, um, northern Europe, north of Italy, uh, and so forth. So Jan van Eyck... Um, we don't really don't have a record of his birth date. Uh, no, no record of his birth date survives, but it is believed um, to have been somewhere around 1390, maybe as late as 1395. Um, this would be probably the the best guess at what he looked like. This is believed to be a self portrait. Um, his career is very well documented. Uh, he was employed between 1422 and 24 at the court of John of Bavaria, Count of Holland, at the Hague. In 1425, he was employed under the service of Duke Philip, the Good of Burgundy, and he became a close member of the Duke's court and then undertook several secret missions, as it were, uh, for the Duke including a trip in uh, some 1428 to 29 to Spain and Portugal in connection with negotiations that resulted in the marriage of Philip of Burgundy and Isabella of Portugal in 1430. In 1432, Van Eyck painted the Adoration of the Lamb, which is the altarpiece for the Church of St. Bavon in Ghent. Uh, let's see if we can get to that. So this is the altarpiece. Um, very important, um, very detailed, very intricate in its uh, content and meaning and message um, and popularity. Um, so in 1432, he paints this this altarpiece and uh, this is basically it, right in the image you may see on the screen um, that's really about the size of a barn door uh, it's huge it's not a small piece at all um, you know in 1432 to 33 Van Eyck buys a house in in Bruges 40, 13, 14, 1434 sorry he created another masterpiece which was the Arnolfini wedding um, and that is this image, which you may have seen, the Arnolfini uh, portrait, 1434. Um, throughout his career, Van Eyck used oil painting in his portraits and panel paintings. Uh, he signed and dated a number of, of paintings between 1432 and 39, all of which are painted in oil and varnished. So according to documents, he was buried in Bruges, Netherlands, on July 9th, 1441. Uh, the Ghent altarpiece, or Adoration of the Mystic Lamb, completed in 1432 by Jan van Eyck, is considered the first great painting of the Renaissance. Um, let's go back there for a second. Too far. So as you see, the reason the adoration of the lamb, if you can see, is very in the very center of the bottom center panel. Uh, there is the lamb bleeding into a cup, uh, a chalice, if you will, of um, and this is representative, of course, of the the Lamb of God who comes to take away the sin of the world, um, but. I don't know if we, we may be able to zoom into some images here in a second, but uh, the Adoration of the Mystic Lamb 
is another name for this. Uh, other panels, as you can see on uh, your screen here, uh, you've got the the Annunciation, which is declaring the birth of Christ to come. Um, you've got, let's see, the Virgin Mary and John the Baptist, and then the crowned Christ. So your top center panels here. You've got Christ on the throne, glorified, John the Baptist at his left, and Mother Mary at his right. Um, and this crowned Christ is very, very detailed that you can actually, if you zoom in close enough, you can uh, see the individual hairs in his beard. I mean, uh, these the imagery is so detailed. And that was part of what set this art form apart, um, that it was so highly and immensely detailed um, that every hair was painted with brushes that may have had one strand to the brush. I mean, there was no, nothing was unintentional. Everything was important. Everything was significant. It had meaning. It had, it was very detailed on purpose. Um, it's arguably the single most important, important painting ever, um, as some scholars say. It's the first great oil painting. It influenced oil painting for centuries to come. It's the first great panel painting of the Renaissance, and it's a forerunner to what we would call artistic realism. The monumentality of it and the complexity of it fascinated people from the moment it was painted. Um, just to give you a little bit of interesting history about this altarpiece at Ghent, um, the painting has had a really insane journey through six centuries of war, theft, and intrigue. Uh, so to start, the altarpiece was painted for the Cathedral of St. Bavo in Ghent, and during the first century of its existence, nothing much really happened. Uh, then in 1566, all hell broke loose, preferably. Um, Protestant militants broke down the cathedral doors with an Im improvised battering ram, considered to be an example of, they thought this artwork was an example of Catholic idolatry and excess. Uh, but alert Catholic guards, knowing that this attack was imminent, were able to dissemble the enormous work and hide it in the cathedral tower, where it actually survived unscathed. Over the next few centuries, the Ghent altarpiece was taken uh, during the Napoleonic Wars and then returned to Ghent. Parts of it were stolen by a vicar at St. Bavo and ended up, after several sales, in a Berlin museum. World War I breaks out, and a brave cathedral canon hides the painting away in a junkman's wagon for safety. It took the Treaty of Versailles to finally reunite all the panels in their original home. The Ghent altarpiece didn't stay safe for long, though. Even then, thieves broke into the cathedral one night in 1934 and made off with the lower left panel. Vic uh, visitors to St. Bavo Cathedral today will see a copy of that missing panel that was painted sometime during World War II. The copy is really a really good copy. Many people don't know it's not the original, but um, it is not. Uh, it is not. The copy is so good that many people thought it might be the original, hidden in plain sight, though recent conservation work has disproved that theory, and the, the panel in the lower left is, in fact, a uh, duplicate to replace the stolen one. So missing panel in all, though, the Gant altarpiece was stolen one last time during World War II on the orders of Nazi General Hermann Goering. The Nazis, and Hitler in particular, were absolutely convinced that the occult and the supernatural was real. The Gant altarpiece was thought to be a sort of mystical treasure map that would show the location of relics of, of the Passion of Christ. Um, the altarpiece ended up hidden with thousands of others, looted artworks in a converted salt mine in Austria. The local SS commander 
had wired the mine with dynamite, determined to destroy all the art as the Allies began closing in. The Ghent altarpiece was eventually saved, though, through the heroism of salt miners and disabled who disabled the bombs and the work of the local Austrian resistance fighters and Allied monuments men, right? Remember there was a movie recently about this, whose job it was to hunt for stolen art. The painting was saved, and you can see it today at the St. Babo Cathedral, Cathedral in Ghent. Jan van Eyck's masterpiece has been involved in seven separate thefts, dwarfing the next runner-up, a Rembrandt portrait, lifted from London's Dolwick Picture Gallery on four occasions that it was stolen. From enduring questions surrounding the movement through the theft and smuggling of the altarpiece as a whole to the mystical symbolism of its content, the altarpiece has haunted scholars and detectives, hunters and protectors, interpreters and worshippers. It is one of art history's great unsolved mysteries. The Ghent altarpiece compromises 20 individual painted panels linked in a massive hinged framework. It is opened on its hinges for religious holidays, but it remains closed for most of the year, at which point only eight of the 20 panels, which are painted on recto and verso, uh, also known as front and back, um, are visible. Subject matter of the verso panels visible when the altarpiece is closed is the Annunciation. The angel Gabriel tells Mary she will bear the Son of God, portraits of the donors who paid for the altarpiece and their patron saints also are on the backside of the altarpiece. Um, the altarpiece has a puzzle box appearance and inside its treasures lie patiently and wait for decipherers. Now, when it's open, the altarpiece's center displays an idealized field full of figures, saints, martyrs, clergy, hermits, we got righteous judges, knights of Christ, and an angelic choir, all making a slow pilgrimage to pay homage to the central figure, which is a lamb on a sacrificial altar, standing proudly while it bleeds into a golden chalice. The scene is referred to as the Adoration of the Mystic Lamb. The precise iconographic meaning of the Adoration of the Mystic Lamb panel and the meaning of the dozens of obscure symbols within it have been the subject of centuries of scholarly debate. Above the vast field of the Adoration of the Mystic Lamb in the, lamb in the upper panels, God the Father sits enthroned with Mary and John the Baptist on either side. Um, or it's Christ, or God in Christ, or the Son and the Father, one and the same, which is a consistent theological theme. Um, you, you might find different interpretations about that top center panel, whether that's Christ or whether that's the Father. Either way, uh, if it's Christ, it's a glorified Christ. So basically as equal with the Almighty God. Um, so the figure has raised, um, in the center there, he has his hand raised in a blessing and a hand painted with, you know, astonishing realism. I mean, if you zoom in close, you can see veins bulging, tiny hairs curl out of the poor, you know, the poor scored skin. You can see the pores on the skin, uh, at his foot, a crown is, and then it cl is clustered in light reflecting jewels, the fringe of his cloak is woven in gold threads and above his head um, arch rune-like ins inscriptions. Individual hairs were lovingly painted into his beard one at a time. His almond eyes express a power and weariness that are altogether human. The level of minute detail is so enormous um, especially considering that the, the size of the, of the piece is giant. Uh, until the altarpiece was painted, only portrait miniatures and illuminated manuscripts could contain such detail. Nothing like this intricacy had ever been seen before on such a grand scale. 
by artists or admirers. Uh, the great art historian Erwin Panofsky famously wrote that Van Eyck's eye functioned as a microscope and a telescope at the same time. Viewers of the Ghent altarpiece, Panofsky explained, are privy to God's vision of the world, capturing some of the experience of him who looks down from heaven but can number the hairs on your head. In the Gen altarpiece, jewels shine with refracted light. One can see individual hairs on the manes of the horses, even. Each of the altarpieces, 100-plus figures have been given personalized facial features. Each figure's face is unique and retains the detail of a portrait, sweat, wrinkles, veins, and flared nostrils. Details range from the mundane to the elegant. Viewers can make out tufts of grass, the wrinkles, and an old worm-eaten apple and warts on double chins. This kind of comes back to, again, the representation of the human uh, by humans. And, and this would be more realistic than it would ever be idealistic. That shows the flaws, the wrinkles, the reality. Uh, representation is intended to be as accurate as possible in a uh, physiological sense. But they can also see, um, you know, the reflection of light caught in a perfectly painted ruby, the folds of a gilded garment, and individual silvery hairs amid the chestnut curls of a beard. The secret weapon that permitted such detail was oil paint. Because oil paints are translucent, artists can build up layer upon layer without covering up what lies beneath. The preferred medium before Van Eyck's time was egg-based tempera, which uh, was essentially op opaque. You know, one layer blotted out the previous layer. But oil allowed for a greater deal of, of you know, subtlety and was easier to control. Van Eyck used some brushes that were so small as to contain only a few animal hairs or bristles. Um, permitting an entirely new level of intricacy. The result is a visual feast, a galaxy of painterly special effects that at once dazzle and provide days of viewing interest, prompting viewers to examine the painting from afar and up close to decipher as well as to bask in its beauty. The Ghent altarpiece, the young Van Eyck's first major public work, was also the first large-scale oil painting to gain international renown. Though he did not invent oil painting, Van Eyck was the first artist to exploit its true capabilities. The artistry, realistic detail, and use of this new medium made the artwork a point of pilgrimage for artists and intellectuals from the moment the paint dried and for centuries to come. The international reputation of the painting and its painter, particularly taking into account its establishment of a new artistic medium that would become the universal choice for centuries, makes for a strong argument that the Ghent altarpiece is the most important painting in history. It is a work of art that centuries of collectors, dukes, generals, kings, and entire armies desired to such an extent that they killed, stole, and altered the strategic course of war to possess it. Um, if you look here also, we have um, this piece, which is really quite fascinating as well, the Arnolfini portrait. Um, this is another example of how nothing in this um, image is on is, is accidental. It's very intentional. Everything from the the wooden sandals on the floor in the bottom left to the um, breed of, of dog that is at their feet, the um, oranges, the fruit growing, you know, sitting on the on the back side of the by the window, sitting near the window, and then you can even see out the window to see uh, fruit tree, cherry tree, 
And so this image was often debated whether this was a um, actual wedding portrait of this couple, but scholars have come to actually believe that it is um, really a, a dedicated painting to the the woman in the painting who has who died giving childbirth. This is what um, some scholars believe that this is really an image of fertility. Um, but it also has a very deep religious meaning hidden in the very back. But um, she appears to be pregnant, but it's not really clear. Um, if you look up at the chandelier, there's a candle burning, right? And then there's some snuffed out candles. It's believed that she may, that that is symbolic to her having died during childbirth, perhaps. Um, it's not really known. But then, in the very back of this image, of this painting, you see on the wall the, the stations of the cross. And just above this image, you know, I don't know if you can see it very well here, but above there basically says Jan van Eyck was here. And when you zoom in, you see a reflection behind them of the, whoever is standing in front of them. So some may think that he may have painted himself in the reflection on the wall, standing there, um, but it's unknown who those figures are. It's not really known. But even the detail that the mirror on the wall and the background of the painting actually is so detailed to reflect what's going on in the room, and even out the window over here. But there is a deep religious meaning to the Stations of the Cross. And uh, the... see if I can show you even more close-up close version here. This thing does not like to scroll. Okay, uh, let's see. Let's look at this. This should take us to a more detailed, highly detailed version. And um, I'm going to zoom in and show you some other things that you can see a lot clearer in a really high definition image. But there was nothing in the in the painting that was a wasted brush stroke. That even the the detail was intentional, right? The to even go more beyond that, we have just the idea that the symbolism of the elements of the painting all are powerfully um, important, intended to convey some kind of message. And so, on the in the background of the painting, there's also um, not sure why I did that. We're gonna do it this way. Intended to convey that there was a uh, the fertility of this couple. So what we're going to do though now, let's just go ahead and um, talk about the Devotio Moderna. Because as we see amazing, you know, important art forms come to pass, and if you want to see those images, all you have to do is Google it. <laughs> so if you want to see the high definition ones, just do go to Google and put the Arnolfini portrait, and then you can also select images in high definition uh, or large size. But what we have here with the Devotio Moderna is what's called the Modern Devotion. Um, and this is an important movement because what it did was it began to institute some Reformation ideas, but not necessarily in a, in a vastly theological way or uh, political way, but reformative in terms of personal piety and devotion to God. Um, Devotio Moderna was first coined in the 1420s by Henry Pomerius, but it dates back to a movement that began in the late, late 1300s. 
in the aftermath of, of and in response to the Black Death and the subsequent bouts of epidemic plague. And it spread across the Low Countries, Germany, France, and parts of Italy. Uh, the movement placed emphasis on the original simplicity of the early church and its faith, what we would call apostolic Christianity. So it appealed to laymen and clerics. Uh, clergy responded to the movement's call for a more holy, devout life by keeping the vows that they had taken. Lay people were especially attracted by an emphasis upon this inner devotional life apart from the church's institutional means of salvation. So the Devotio Moderna began in the Netherlands. A Dutch religious reformer uh, preacher by the name of Gerhard Gruta lived from 1340 to 1384. He started this movement. So here's Gert Gruta also known as Gerardus Magnus, that'd be his Latin name, um, born October 16th, 1340. Uh, he starts this movement. Gruta tries to combine a genuine heartfelt piety with a deep appreciation for learning and education, and he foster, fosters that double appreciation for faith and, and education in, in all those that he converted. Uh, he converted in 1374. Strongly, uh, he strongly desired to live a devoted Christian life and served as a monk and later as a missionary preacher. In his preaching in the vernacular Dutch, um, which is always reformative, if someone's preaching outside of Latin in these times, it's it's um, it's controversial because it's not it, it's a, it's considered the vulgar tongue, right? Not the language of the church. Latin, which is what the Bible, the Vulgate, is written in. Um, he denounced the church abuses at the time and ended up getting his license withdrawn. Uh, he then founds the Brethren of Common Life. He stresses a communal and simple lifestyle, devotion to Christ, serving, serving the um, you know those in the world, and com being committed to education. Both his parents died as a result of the plague. He was left with a considerable amount of wealth. He lived a luxe and lavish lifestyle at that, growing up and then began to practice magic and astrology. And then one day he gets confronted by a mystic prophet who basically asks him, what are you doing? He gets deathly ill and almost dies after this. Then he has this conversation with a friend and that eventually leads Gerta, Gerhard Gruta to, uh, to his conversion. He decides to burn all of his magic books, forsakes his possessions and home. Um, he actually gives his home to, to, poor women, to a place for poor women and spends five years just in devotion to God um, and, and worshiping, watching and praying as Thomas uh, Akempis We'll call it, and Thomas Akempis is an important figure as well. Part of this movement we'll talk about in a second. Um, a complex and multifaceted movement to this Devotio Moderna was primarily a great lay revival, though it was accompanied by monastic and educational reform. The systematic meditations that were central to Devotio Moderna, piety focused on episodes in Christ's life. Um, so each meditation that was part of the, the devotion was to every day meditate on something all day long that Christ did. So each meditation was intended to, to set the tone for the entire day, a constant refrain that was to be the mental backdrop of all the day's activity. Uh, literate practitioners of the Devotio Moderna kept spiritual notebooks and journals and out of this movement came some radical devotional literature, um, especially, like I said, Thomas Akempis is uh, over here on the left, and this is kind of a just a random cover to one of the books, but uh, versions of his ebook. I think actually you can find it online, "The Imitation of Christ." Uh, interestingly, the 
The Imitation of Christ is second in most frequently published books in the, the Christian West to the Bible. So the Bible would be the most frequently published book in the Christian West well into the modern times. Um, and The Imitation of Christ by Thomas Kempis was the number two on that list. Thomas Kempis, you know, uh, he, he was a monk, actually, um, in the Augustinian house. And uh, The Imitation of Christ, the Amatio de Christi, um, grew out of the, his practice of meditating and devote and spending time in devotion. Um, one of the, a large number of reformed monasteries, the Augustinian house, that rose up in response to uh, this religious revival that began by Gerhard Gruta. So there you go. There's a little bit on the Devotio Moderna. Um, this was taking place in the north as well. Um, and then we have the, uh, the, the movement in the art world there with um, Jan van Eyck. And a little bit of a close look at the interesting and controversial Ghent altarpiece and um, the fascinating, highly detailed Arnolfini um, portrait. So, we'll close it this lecture at that.